Hello, and welcome to uh, Conducting Change Part 2. Uh, my name is Titus Underwood. I am the principal oboe of the Nashville Symphony and also a 2021 recipient of the Swing Smell of Excellence Award. And I would like to really get into the conversation, how do we empower uh, and conduct change that we want to see within this field? And today I am joined by three fabulous guests that I have with me. I'd like to talk a little bit about them and they'll tell you about themselves. We have Kalina Bavel, who's assistant conductor of the Memphis Symphony Orchestra. We have Lena Gonzalez Granados, who's conducting fellow of the Philadelphia Orchestra and the Seattle Symphony. And we have Paula Magical, who's the artistic director and conductor of Orchestra Northwest. Please welcome our three guests. Thank you so much for joining me. So I would like to jump in first of all, maybe I can throw this straight to Kalina first. Uh, we're just, and each one of you can answer this question. Uh, first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and who or what inspired you to conduct. Well, so Titus, nice to see you again, um, as well as Lena and Paula. Um, so I'm Kalina Bovell. I am originally from Los Angeles, California, uh, currently living in Memphis, Tennessee, where I am the assistant conductor of the Memphis Symphony. I'm also a conductor of the Memphis Youth Symphony. Um, and, you know, Memphis has been lovely because of all the barbecue, just saying. Um, <laughs> in terms of who inspired me to conduct. So outside of my parents, you know, and my friends and colleagues, um, there were two people who really inspired me on this journey. Um, one was Ken Kiesler, um, and I got to work with him in 2010 at his conductor's retreat at Madomic. Um, at Madomic, I basically refound my confidence um, as a musician, as a person, as a conductor. And then also my grad school teacher, Edward Cumming. I feel I owe a lot to Hart, and I feel like I wouldn't be I wouldn't be where I am right now if it weren't for Hart and working with Edward. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much. Lena? Hello, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be sharing this piece with you, Titus, as a fellow medalist, and also with my good friend Paula and Kalina, which we met actually in Medomag in that time where you refound your confidence and uh, redefined what you wanted. I am uh, currently what I do uh, as a fellow of the fellow conductor or a conducting fellow of the Philadelphia Orchestra in Seattle. And um, also I'm the artistic director of an orchestra that I found seven years ago, um, Unitas Ensemble, which focused their work in celebrating the art of Latinx composers. And I want to say that uh, there are a couple of people who inspire me. I feel like in these 34 years of my life, I had had uh, lived at least three lifetimes in itself. And in those three lifetimes, I had different role models. I have to say my current role model definitely is one of my music directors, Yannick Nesesegan, who I work really closely and it, he's extremely inspiring. And then a couple of teachers throughout the way, uh, Bernard Haiting, which I actually regained my confidence with him in Europe a couple of years ago, Marin Alsop, who gave me my first opportunities. And uh, consistently throughout my life, my parents are the ones who inspired me to conduct. Uh, they didn't know what, what I was going for, and they just like pushed me uh, to be my best self and put uh, what I wanted to say and have a voice in this world. So I owned it to my parents. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, and last but not least, Paula. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me today. Uh, I'm so excited. Uh, my name is Paula Madrigal and I am from Guadalajara, Mexico. Actually, I live in Seattle and I have a nonprofit organization. The, nom the name is Orchestra Northwest. And that nonprofit organization, we have different programs. We have Ballard Civic Orchestra. We have the World Youth Orchestra. We support Latinos. And this program is totally free. We offer um, instruments, strings, private lessons, orchestra, everything for free. We have like around five years doing that project. And we have a, in, in that um, Orchestra Northwest, we have another project that is Cascade Conducting. That is a um, conducting masterclass. Uh, the teacher is Sara Ionides. Um, and we have some scholarships. We have scholarship for women, for Latinos, for African-Americans. 
and more. And who inspired me? The first conductor that I saw conducting was uh, Alondra de la Parra. She was conductor here in Guadalajara. And she gave me the opportunity to study with Kenneth Kisler in Mexico City. And later I, I do to the Medomac. I did the Medomac too. And someone that inspired me, and I don't know her, and is, her name is uh, Sonia Marie de Leon. When I came to United States, I didn't know any Latina conductors. And I looked in the internet, and I, that was the first name that I found. And only for see another Latina that looks like me in that time that inspired me for continuing my dreams in the United States. And of course, my teacher, Guillermo Salvador, he gave me free lessons for years here in Guadalajara, I and mean, I'm so thankful for that. Uh, of course, the Maestra Sara Ionides, that um, she's a wonderful person with a great family and a very professional um, conductor. And thank you for having me again. Of course, of course, that's great. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how mentors and people in places can uh, really change the trajectory where you go. Um, and also just seeing representation, you know, seeing someone who looks like you doing what you do which sparks your imagination that leads you to where you are today. So thank you to all the mentors and, and, and that are leading, you know, put, laying down that groundwork for us to have a better tomorrow. Um, the next question I want to get to, maybe we can start with, uh, since Polly, you're the last person to speak, you can start with this. And we're going to get right into the meat of the conversation, as I like to do. <laughs> so what do you think are the best ways to deal with programming and tokenism? And what would you like to conduct? OK, what is tokenism? Tell well, me. Absolutely. Tokenism is a lot of times, hey, let's just have let's 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 have a woman conductor here. Not we're just gonna put her there, let's have a black and just put them there, but there's no cultural representation. It's there, there's a repertoire that comes with that. It's just another face with the same exact program that's going on, but we fulfilled a number which is there. So instead of just going for your expertise and where you've come from and what you have to offer, let's let's really really hire this person because of their expertise and what they do and the cultural richness in which they bring so how do we deal with programming and what would you like to conduct based off of your experience you know tokenism probably doesn't exist that is a makeup for equity mm. Mm. no like I mean, if you put someone of color i'm sure that person has the experience and the talent and and all the work in the back mm. you understand this point yes yes, it's yes equity yes. is not tokenism is this tokenism is a word for excuse for for don't invite people of color mm. or don't have equity mm. if you go to the street in the united states you see faces of all the colors not only white or any any color mm. and that color should be in the orchestras Mm. Absolutely. Only see, go to one concert, sit in the middle, in the audience, go to the front, go to the back, later go to the street. Mm. The people in the street needs to be in the orchestras, in the stage and in the audience. Mm. 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 Okay. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, Lena, what would you like to say to this? Um. I, um, unlike Paola, I do think tokenism is a, a real problem in, in orchestra. orchestra. And um, I think one of the ways that I like to think uh, of my programming philosophy and my season is that different orchestras and different societies are in different parts of the pipeline. So from the beginning of those conversations, like from the beginning of those conversations when we have these careful then and not so careful sometimes uh, when we when they approach me and they want to El Dia de los Muertos or I don't know, no. Cinco de Mayo concerts of, or, or those, I definitely, um, those I try to shy away from. And um, that's the very first thing. And then when we have, when we establish those relationships with artistic administrators and presence and like in my own work, I, like to think about the audience and how these audiences can be. Um, no, first of all, I, let me let me organize a little bit myself. I like to think of my mission as a 
uh, as a conductor, like how do I like to be remembered and what music do I want to be remembered by? And uh, with that in mind, I have like a set of expertises that I bring to the table, whether that is like with women composers, uh, portfolios and with Latin Latinx uh, portfolios and also with the canon. And what pieces do I like to, to conduct? And also uh, when I have those conversations, I really, I really push, uh, like I really push and try to humanize uh, these tokenism conversation then it's like hey I'm a human I'm here and I have this set of expertise like listen to I, what I have to say and sometimes it's really successful when we have like these um, when we set when we set the tone of the conversation we can have like a one-on-one -on -one and then we can find those places where this conversation unites you know like what do they know about their audiences that maybe I don't know and how can I uh, push my, my own voice into this programming. And the pieces that I would like to conduct, I definitely uh, want to conduct again, the Concerto for Orchestra of Gabriela Frank, uh, which was premiered in Detroit, but, but I did the premiere in South America. And it's just like one of those pieces that moves beyond a, a, how do you call it? A realismo magico, magical realism. And, you know, it's like she lives in these amazing two worlds where I don't even know uh, myth and what is reality. So I liked that piece. And I would like to pair that piece with also Sprague Zaratustra because it's a great piece and I don't want to die without not conducting that piece. So Absolutely. why not, you know? Shout out to Gabriela Frank. <laughs> yes, right. absolutely. What a what a individual. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, Kalina, please. You know, I think firstly it's important just to acknowledge that tokenism exists, you know, and because sometimes people tend to shy away from the words, shy away from the topic. I remember it was Tom Wilkins conductor who said, you know, he's the busiest during Black History Month. Right. Yeah. But and he said, sure, an orchestra might hire me because I'm black to conduct an all black program, but they're going to ask me back because they realize I'm qualified at what I do. And I think that, again, we need to acknowledge that tokenism, tokenism exists, but we also need to acknowledge that people of color, musicians of color, we have more to offer than our skin colors. Like we are qualified to either stand on the podium, play our instruments you know, serve on a board, be in administration. Um, and so when it comes to programming, I have very similar ideologies as Lena. Um, I always program with my audience in mind. What do they need to hear? What do they not know they need yet? What have they not been exposed to outside of the classics and the canon? You know, Beethoven, Haydn, Mozart. But then I also think of the orchestra, meaning how can I stretch challenges to orchestra um, so that they also feel successful? Um, and then something I've been thinking about recently, which comes from Teddy Abrams, is just, you know, what is my programming personality? Who, who exactly do I want to be when it comes to programming? So being a Black Latina, I want to do music by women. I want to do music by Latin American composers and also Black composers. So I'm really passionate about Coleridge Taylor right now, um, you know, after doing his piece in London with the Chinigay Orchestra and also seeing the documentary that was um, done about him. I've kind of um, had this new affinity for his music. And I also wanna discover the music of Panamanian composers. Right now I know of one. And so I'm doing some research to discover more. And then I love Clarissa Saad. Um, when I was at the Cabrillo Festival, they did her violin concerto. And I was like, I need to know more about this woman because her music is legit, just being very colloquial about it. So, you know, I think programming for me is just, it, it encompasses all of those different elements. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for all your answers. Just um, and don't forget to, uh, to use the Q and A. We are live here, so you can use Q and A. I mean, throw us a curveball, you know, throw us off our square a little bit. We love to dive deep into the conversation. Um, I want to go into the next uh, next conversation. Um, uh, I want to say, how can and anyone can jump in there and answer this? It can be, you know, jump in and. and it's a free for all here. Uh, how can men aid in empowering women composers and conductors? And should women lead the charge for women composers? I can start. Absolutely. Um, I I want to say that uh, both men and women have been like instrumental into my, the way that I um, that they have taught me and how I have approached music. 
but it has been uh, like the most successful uh, relationships that I had uh, with both. No, let's talk about with men. Is the ones that actually allyship looks like a like it's not a, about them trying to save me, <laughs> but actually that they gave me a place um, and a space in in the table to talk as equals, and. I say this in different roles of leadership that I serve, like uh, in the supporting role that is assistant conducting and cover conductor, um, in the same as being a music director of uh, an opera production that you come and go, or just uh, as as a music director of your own ensemble, <laughs> you want oh wish wait you want to have a conversation with someone that 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 is not condescending or just going down on you like going down this conversation it's just like we are equal so um I always have like the best relationships when when I feel like I'm hurt and um, it sounds logical but it's not you know the fact that we actually have to say it um, is because sometimes it just doesn't happen so um that that being said, I think the most is like when we just take the like messiah <laughs> complex and just like let me speak <laughs> and and just like t make other decisions after you make me like, after I speak and and say my mind because I think that's you want to be heard you want to claim your space you want to just be known for for your words and not uh, for your gender your face or your race absolutely absolutely Paula. I think it's a work to everyone, men and women. We have to support uh, women conductors. And it's very important because uh, it's not usually that we play uh, works by women. In my orchestra, only I work it with uh, one woman composer. Like uh, we work together for create a, a, new, a new piece for the orchestra and we did a premiere in Seattle. And I think it's, it's important that all women and men, women and men. Karina? So when I think about this, I guess I think of this in two ways. I think one, these spaces and these opportunities need to be created for women. And in order for that to happen, certain people need to step aside, if that makes sense. Um, and then two, going on with what Lena and Paola both said, you know, there does need to be some type of relationship, collaboration, some type of partnership. But it's as Lena said, we also need to be heard. You know, so meaning be quiet for one or two seconds and listen to what we have to say, because you could learn something from that, maybe not. But it's just it's just giving us and giving women those opportunities to be, to be able to share in their ideas. And so for your second question about women conductors championing um, the music of women composers, I think it's twofold. You know, one, if the music is great, then yes, I want people to hear this music, but I also don't want to program a piece by a woman conductor just because she is a woman. You know what I mean? So I, I feel like, again, there has to be some type of educational process behind your programming and what you're doing. So if you want to champion, which is the, the word I tend to use often, if you want to champion a woman composer, that is fantastic. But also be sure that it's because you truly believe in that music and that you want other people to hear that music. Don't just do it to say that, you know, you check something off a box. Can I say something? Uh, yes, I, I <laughs> yeah, no, because I'm listening. I'm listening to you, you know, I'm letting you talk <laughs> yeah, get in your space. No, actually, I agree a lot with what you say um, about programming because uh, you believe in it. And I would say that we always talk about quality. And uh, I think we talk about it when we were preparing about this ex um, exercise. I did a, a whole season um, Pre 2016, I did a whole season with my orchestra. It was all women composers, and uh, what I found myself doing is like falling into my own biases of what it was good and was was wrong. I was like, oh my god, this is so good. Oh, this is terrible. And I was just measuring by the uh, I don't know the old measuring tape of what's good and what's bad. That is uh, taking uh, like taking all this like building more glass ceilings. 
So I would say that more than what it makes it passionate is like, for me, it's more important to, if you want to champion a composer, it's not because only you like it, but because you have done the work to actually know their music really well and mm -hmm. deep. You know, that it's like that, and it's not, oh, it's not only about expertise, but yes, if you stand in the podium, you really need to make the work to speak for these voices. And I wanna say, I mean, because I didn't answer that question, I really want to answer. I don't think all women or everyone have to champion uh, some music if they don't feel like it. Um, it's it's a touchy point how do I how I say it, but um, what I think is that it has to come from a real motivation, not because you're just a woman or just because you're a conductor of color that you have to champion people of color. Uh, you really, for me, it's a, like a, a motivation that goes beyond that. Like when I program, uh, how, however I program, it's like, okay, how do I want, I want to structure my season? Like uh, my personal goals and my personal benchmarks are actually having this amount of music of women, having this amount of music of Latinx composer, because this is who I am. I can't shy away for it, but not necessarily because I have to do it and that's it. So there's a lot of other people that really don't thrive into that. And I prefer that, that people go to other repertoires instead of doing it in a fake way, just because they just want to get a place to conduct. You know, like really, we really need to, yeah, we really need to be like true about this. It's like, is this music really speaking to you? Uh, just commit to it, it takes courage. To, you know, and consistency as well. If you are, want to advocate for a voice, you know, it's a full-time job. So you will really need to go with all your heart to do it. Well, and so what this made me think of was, you know, once the Black Lives Matter movement started and a lot of organizations were committed to programming the works of Black composers, um, just having conversations with friends, it was, you know, here's a program. Okay, but we, we need a piece by a Black composer, but why? Is it because you strongly feel that that voice will help to elevate this program? Or again, we just we just need to insert X piece. And so when, when I was talking about, and again, Lena, I loved everything you just said. And so when I was talking about, don't just program something to program it, it's, it's from that point of view of, well, this is my placeholder. And so, well, let me just put this into that because then you're doing your audience and your orchestra a huge disservice mm -hmm. as well as yourself. Yeah, and, and into and this is a great link to where we're going with the conversation. Um, I, I have this quote that I I usually say when asking about programming, is um, you know we we find find the for lack of better words find the bangers of the, these composers right find the best works of the composers mind the best works of these composers you know um, William Grant still wrote over three hundred works you know and Florence Price wrote more than just her first symphony. So there, there we don't play Tchaikovsky's third every season. We probably play four, five, and six. We don't play Mozart's sixth symphony. Does anyone know what that sounds like? So I think, <laughs> I think these type of examples where if you're truly interested in this person's voice and you can see the trajectory and how they've developed over time, then you can find those best pieces. And also it can even check those quote unquote boxes. Cause if you're looking for a romantic season, right? You're gonna look for specific composers to fill that box for the romantic season or the classical season, but you're gonna put the best pieces in that word. So we're highlighting something specific. There's greatness, even in specificity. And to go on to specific, specificity, let's go a little bit deeper with this as uh, Kalina brought up the Black Lives Matter movement, how orchestras were making these statements, you know, we stand with Black Lives Matter. And um, this is the last question I ask from me, and then we'll go down the, the questions is filling up. So I'm gonna to get to some of these questions that are coming up here. Um, I, I, I'm gonna frame this and say, we stand in solidarity with all communities of color and up, underrepresented um, uh, people. And we this is a space where we can talk about, you know, um, all these things. And, and this, this is where the conversation happens here. Uh, however, in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement, what suggestions do you have to orchestral institutions as it pertains specifically to Black players in this Black Lives Matter movement? Does anyone want to take that first? Girls, ladies. <laughs> um, 
And I really have to think about this one. Um, suggestions as it pertains to black players. Black players, black conduct music, all of it as it pertains to orchestra. What what would we what is the accountability piece we'll have that you well, suggest to institutions? Well, so firstly, there needs to be accountability, right? Like so one people need to acknowledge, even if it comes to repertoire, which we have mainly been talking about, that the lack of diversity in your repertoire. And if there is a lack of diversity, why? ask yourself that question, why haven't we been doing X, Y, and Z? When you go into a board meeting and you look at the people serving on that board, and let's say it's 95% um, white, why? Why haven't we diversified our board? When you look at your orchestra itself, and you might say there's two black musicians, or two um, musicians of color out of 90 people, why? Why have you not been doing the work? So most organizations need to hold themselves accountable, but two, they also need to have those very uncomfortable conversations because growth comes from discomfort. And I'm gonna quote Kalita Jones on that one from Sphinx last year, but a lot of organizations don't wanna have those conversations because they don't wanna look themselves in the eye and basically highlight all the things that still need to be changed and so that they can move forward. So when it comes to black musicians in these spaces, I think one is creating these spaces so that black musicians feel comfortable to come forward with um, their thoughts and their ideas and not have to worry about their jobs, you know, at the end of the day. Absolutely. I don't absolutely. know if that answers your question, oh, yeah. but that's absolutely, absolutely. That's 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 a great answer. Yes. Um, anyone else want to jump in on this question? Well, I I have a hard time with this question, uh, and I think is. Um, well, it's not a hard like um, I have a personal hard time um, because um, I think uh, or no, I have grown uh, when in Latin America and I, I speak for my Latin American experiences, we uh, the spectrums of racism and colorism uh, sometimes is so behind that I find myself a little bit behind in this conversation um, because I was born and raised in a place of privilege and I acknowledge it. And I just think that in with that in mind, it has um, made me step aside. And I just want um, black musicians to feel free to take the space that they need. Uh, and that's what I want to encourage by stepping aside. Um, having said that, I think it's necessary that um, organizations have uh, benchmarks and they have like they, they really have goals that they have to reach for accountability because um, as we we are way behind what uh, in the or the classical music world and the concert world way behind for what's happening in the world right now so by keeping the only way to keep up is to actually be accountable and make those benchmarks public and see if we are actually making them uh, like we are truly going towards those changes. So I think there has to be a reckon within inside the organizations and some of the organizations are doing it even way before I have been privileged to see those conversations, for example, at the Philadelphia Orchestra and which I proudly am part of in Seattle and uh, in, in those, the, the conversations were happening before uh, Black Lives Matter. And hey, you know, as a, a result, uh, um, like there are people like that look like me in positions of conducting in the staffs of orchestras like that. It's new. So we just, we just need to keep doing the work and keep talking the uncomfortable talks with the, with the higher administrations at the boards, Absolutely. you know, to make the change. Absolutely. Paula, would you like to chime in on that? Yes, I think definitely we need more African Americans and people of colors in the orchestra. It's the same that I told you before. You go to a concert and you see the stage and you see the audience, and we don't have enough people of colors. One day was in a con I was in a concert, like a 100 people on the stage and 400 people on the audience, and I didn't see one single African American. Mm -hmm. My skin was the darkest one in that uh, in that theater, and for me it was so surprising. 
And I think if we have some African Americans uh, um, conductors or music players, they need to support uh, young people. Uh, maybe be mentors for free, but th they need to do something. And we all need to do something. I think we need to start for the education. You don't want to have one um, change in one year. We, we need to start from when the kid is five years old or before with the families. It's important to start for the families and they, under they can understand that it's important the music education. And maybe this change going to take 10 years or something like that, but has to be um, for, for when the kid is, is young. Um, with my organization, we um, sometimes we had support um, young kids and we, we gave them uh, free, free lessons. And, and we have this program in Cascade Conducting that we, we give a, um, a scholarship for African-American and they can empower themselves and empower their communities. Mm, mm, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I, I always like to frame that as, you know, we have a lot of work to do and it's, it's not it's not absent of solidarity, but sometimes specificity. Uh, you, you know, uh, some sometimes I see the Latinos or African-Americans, they are in a high position and they don't look down. They they only look where they are and they are very happy because they they have the great gig, but they don't have their communities. Mm. Mm. You bring you bring up some good points here. You bring up the good points. Yes, if you don't help yourself, who's going to help you? Absolutely. Who's going to change this? Absolutely. Mm. Sometimes they are in the in the good positions, and um, and uh, sometimes they they try to separate from their communities because they don't they don't want they relate them with with their communities. Absolutely. I don't know. I I don't understand that. Yeah. No. You you bring up a good point. I always say um, there's things that I bring up, man. When there's more mass of people there, it, it, there, there comes a culture. So if it's one or two that can be thrown into the tokenism, and there's ten, you know, then there's a cultural change. And I say, say for instance, we're since we're in this question about uh, specific, specificity of black players, you know, um, you have to have a big enough critical mass within an institution so that you have diversity of thought within that people group. Then you have a proper representation of the culture of people that are that are there because you can have one person there that got their opinion but that's their opinion but more people bring about better crystallized ideas for institutions to have the proper thing to move forward um and this this goes on to um i want to talk about sending the ladder down is what we went towards what paul was talking about people getting positions and then uh you know there there's the token some people maybe we say someone takes advantage of the tokenism right that's there or someone say i have my position and 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 people not necessarily sending that ladder down. So I want to ask uh, either one of you, and one of you can answer this question: Is do you have mentors that are music directors who can help prepare you for your eventual music director position? Is there someone that you're working with that's helping you get to that next step that you would like to go to? Who would like to take that question? Yes, I want uh, uh, every, like a thousand times yes. Uh, from all parts of the spectrum. I have to say one of my uh, best friends and partners in crime is Nicole Jordan, who's the librarian of the Philadelphia Orchestra. And she's the first African-American librarian in a major orchestra. And she has been absolutely important for me to prepare myself as a music director on the music side, because she's an astounding musician, astounding orchestra musician. And then from that on, I have a amazing, amazing conductors who have helped me. Uh, my teachers at school who have prepared me for that, but, but oh, uh, music directors, uh, I want to say um, Branwell Toby was my teacher and he was a music director in Vancouver. Um, Yannick, definitely Yannick has helped me uh, tons to prepare me for that because he leads he leads those conversations and um, also uh, no so so many people I mean I think I, if there is anything that I'm grateful for is that um, 
everyone who I have crossed paths with have been incredible towards my advancement. Giancarlo, uh, Marin, uh, Matias Tarnotarovsky, Krishna in Seattle, he opened the doors, people in boards, you know, yeah. once they knew me, they, there was a, an opportunity to do it. So I don't know, it's so many that, that it sounds like a, a, a big list, but I think everybody, everybody in different ladders of, the, of different organizations that I have worked have helped me, not only music directors mentoring me in that. that. I don't know. Did it make sense? I was, it's, um, it's like a stream of saying, of, of a list of thanks, but it's really not like they actually have helped me because they have yes. met, like they have taught me something. That's absolutely. I mean, mentors play a big part in, in uh, where we are. I mean, people that are that are in the place, you know, we have many uh, plugs that are out there with no outlets and we need plugs and outlets to make sure that people are properly empowered in the place that they are. So um, I want to move on to to uh, another question as it pertains to uh, a lot of the questions here are saying like uh, talking about systematic racism that are in the and in, in, in gender biases in the world. And we talked about repertoire. And this question kind of sparked my, my thinking and any of you can answer this is regarding systematic racism slash gender bias in the classical music world. While there is so much conversation currently and semi actionable semi actionable plans getting put in place, you know, the formation of committees, the designation of DEI directors. Is the needle truly moving or are we just forming committees? Are we truly making sustainable change? Can anyone answer that question? I These think consistency is key. It's a, it's a great question. I, I think it's hard to speak from um, like from a, such a macro side of, of things because uh, we have we have found uh, I think the last couple of weeks and years how how different and how how different we are wired and in different realities that we're living in and that makes it so challenging like to judge classical music as one uh, in America as the same as it's in Europe and it's in Latin America it's just impossible to measure so I think that um, consistency is key. I, I saw it in this um, past um, talk uh, with Garrett McQueen, which I had like the one with audiences and podcasts, which was absolutely mind blowing. And he was saying consistency is key. And I think as um, we need to see, I, I think in a couple of years, we'll see if the thread will move in our favor, but and but we need to do the job like globally. It has to be in every single part. It cannot be only a uh, women conductors doing the work or Latinx conductors or African American conductors. It has to be from every single part. I mean, and we need to amplify it to audiences. We need to bring these audiences in to do the work for us too, because otherwise we we will run out of gas. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think what's I think what's also important to know too is, as Lena said, consistency is key. But I think it's also going to become um, apparent in the next couple of years who was actually serious about doing this work and who was jumping on a bandwagon, yeah. right? Because I think a lot of people have jumped on a bandwagon, which is completely fine. Because how many different pieces by Florence Price, William Grant Still, William Donson, you know, that have we discovered? But again, consistency is is going to be the telling thing as to how this will all last in the next couple of years or not? I think it's changing. When I came to the United States, um, I was born in Mexico and here the things, we have our problems, but it's different, no? I went to a professional orchestra concert. Nobody looks like me, like almost nobody. And I went to Jude Orchestra and almost nobody looks like me. Maybe uh, an African-American kid was in the last cello and was, that was so surprising for me. I think now the things are changing. We, we see more faces, uh, we, we see more diversity. But one thing that um, don't, uh, doesn't like me, don't like me is, for example, you see in the universities or in the orchestras, probably they have two students African-Americans or Latinos, and it put the picture to that students in the 
in the magazine or in the poster. Like, right, right. Uh, yeah, I like that you're trying, but that's not true. If you see and you walk in the university, there is only a few uh, diversity. That's not true. But is there? Is there, I think it's good beginning. Right, right, absolutely. I, I really bother me like when I see a magazine of a, a university and you see the only a student of color that you have in 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 the picture. Right, right. You know, I have to say, uh, uh, and I'm not gonna say which university was who was who did this, but one of the universities that I was part of asked me if I could give a quote for um, what they didn't mean to, um, to, to, to study in, the, in this place. And I said, you know, it was a huge privilege and everything. And then I received these, um, I received these uh, in, the, in the mail, mail, I received like a booklet and there was my picture with my quote. And it says, if you want to see more people like her who, who study here and had this scholarship, and I, I, I didn't catch my entire thing. Nobody gave me a scholarship. Because, and then I was like, nobody gave me a scholarship to study in your place and you're, and you're asking on behalf of my color. Like we really, really need to be honest. We really need to, like, I, I think we need to cut the, the shortcuts to what can be done. And the, the, the truth is that the, 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 it's like the Titanic, you know? You know, it moves really slowly. And that's something that we need to acknowledge. But at the same time, we need to keep doing the work. You know, we cannot, it, there, are no, there are no shortcuts to actual change. So we just, just need to keep doing the work in our communities. Right, a lot of times orchestras can be uh, a Titanic turning around in a swimming pool. So, you know, it's a, <laughs> a very small space, but a very big object to move. And we're talking about, you know, a culture and, and quality and representation. And, you know, the conversation of culture is a different thing. And the conversation of quality is a different, is a different thing, but somehow those two merge. We're talking about breaking away from the the, the the thing that we put all, on all the time, the consistent things. And the reason why Beethoven is played so much because it's consistently played. It's consistently heard. Mozart is consistently played, consistently heard. This is a preservation type of art form that we're in. I mean, of course, we innovate, but we preserve so much. And part of that preservation is doing it over and over and over again. So part of that is just being consistent, like you said, doing it, oh, being intentional. All these things were intentionally put Purposeful. in place. And how can we intentionally do it another way? And with that, I would like to lead to another question that's coming. We have some great questions in here. Um, when exploring, when in, exploring new composers, how do you remove the cultural slash canonical bias about what is quote unquote good? How do we break away from good being measured on a white Western male scale? That's a really interesting thing to answer. And I would say that everybody, every time I get asked uh, about quality, I would always answer that quality, like in my, in my, in my opinion, quality is like the bare minimum. You know, quality is the bare minimum, like how, how you transcend with the piece is more important for me because uh, we are skewing so much music in the terms of, oh, this is what you, it needs to be played. And, Hey, you touch upon something really important that I think it ties here, which about consistently play, uh, creating spaces for, for example, Florence Price uh, that we've talked, we touch upon, or from a Latin American uh, composer and, to, and um, digging deep into the pieces to create for yourself to, uh, and find those performance practice, you know, like creating, like, actually going uh, the, the extra mile to actually establish performance practice for these pieces. How does it have to, like, if, if there is any. And with that in mind, I think one way to, to do that is just to put it into perspective. Those pieces are not uh, isolated and they weren't born like out of something. I mean, as much as there is a uniqueness of the repertoire, the sound world, um, there is also, they are born from the same DNA, which is music. They, it's notes. I mean, the notes are universal. The combination of how we speak it is, is the, it, it's different, but 
they are born from the same, you know? So um, I don't know for, for me, it's just like, do we really, do, do we really have to aspire just for the bare minimum, which is artistic quality? Is that the only thing I think that I think about? It's like, it's like, for example, when you are as a chef, and I'm not saying I'm not comparing myself to a Michelin star by any chance, but <laughs> it's like asking, yeah, no, maybe. definitely not. But it's like asking a chef to do a McDonald's happy meal. Right. You know, like seriously, like let's let's go beyond that and just like found those points where we can all like get together. Like it's, it's just notes, you know, combined differently. Absolutely, absolutely. Born Anyone in the else? same way. Absolutely. Anyone else want to answer that question? Yes, please, please. Absolutely. Um, I like to program a lot of music from Mexico. I'm Mexican, and I think it's also music. It's not <clears throat> only because I'm Mexican. I know that music because I'm from here, no? But the composers are awesome. And for example, um, one thing that surprised me is this relationship between Chavez and Copland. They call it, they were, they were very good friends, but the reality, Chavez was, uh, how you can say, um, he inspired a lot of Copland, his music. Do you understand his point? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, they are great composers, only nobody knows the music. That's the problem. Right, right. And the thing I, I want to highlight is, um, Sometimes I've been a lot of conversations about this about repertoire and representation. Is um, we when we go to conservatory, we learn the uh, the diaspora of of the European canon. You know, we're we're learning the diversity just in in, in a particular place. Yeah, so you know, I in the school I I studied <clears throat> my first studies I did here in in Mexico in Guadalajara. I didn't learn about these composers in the school. Despite that I was in Mexico, right. I learned playing in the orchestra because everybody knows them in Mexico. But in the orchestra, we thought about the uh, traditional composers. Absolutely, and it's not saying that these other these quote unquote traditional composers don't that immense value to our lives, and we don't love listening to that stuff. You know, I'm a big fan of Brahms and 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 Bach. You know, I, I love those composers. It's and, and it's beautiful music. However, if there is intentionality in, in, you know, making sure that, you know, Brahms is different from Haydn and Haydn is different from Shostakovich and Shostakovich is different from Debussy. So that same type of difference, you know, resides within, you know, uh, black cultures and Latinx culture. It, it, there's that vast difference that's there. It's not a blanket thing that's there. So that advances the conversation that we go deeper into just the melon, but also the lineage and specific cultural language that each person has to bring to the stage. Um, you know, I remember this phrase. I saw this in a documentary. I don't remember who said it, but this composer said, they don't like our music because our music looks like us. Mm. Mm. Interesting. That's interesting. That's a very, that's a very, yeah. absolutely. That's a very, the very, very powerful statement. Very strong statement. I, I think we're, we're coming close to, we, we may have to squeeze in two more questions. I'm going to try to get, because there are a lot of questions out here. Okay. Since each one of you are, are, I, maybe you'll be my music director someday. Who knows? So maybe I'm talking to my future bosses here. So maybe I should be careful with that. But I want to bring up one question as the audition process. This comes up a lot in a lot of different forms. It's something that's been uh, put forward. You know, uh, I, I was one of the people who helped put together, you know, the Nas um, uh, letter that went out to the industry. Mm -hmm. And I want us to kind of dive a little bit and just go a, a different direction with this. Uh, I want to ask, can you speak to the increasing diversity through the orchestral uh, audition process? Should screens be used through all rounds or are there ways to increase diversity amongst finalists? What would you think as if you're becoming a new music director, what do you think are the best audition practices that can be done for your orchestra to ensure that we're increasing the type of um, representation and, and cultural um, uh, empowerment within our institutions? 
I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I have the answer for this question. At least what comes to my mind initially is that if you want a certain type of person to audition for your orchestra, then you have to go out and find those people. So meaning if you want um, assistant conductors of color, go out and find those people because they do exist. Don't just put an ad on the, all the conductor and master classes and then be surprised that you get 100 conductors who are white and let's say two conductors of color. You know, so one, I think it has to do with putting in the work to find the type of people that you want um, auditioning for your organization. For example, in our programs in Cascade Conducting, this is for conductors. We offer one fellowship. In that fellowship, anyone can apply. But we want to support African-American and we offer one scholarship for African-American. We want to support women and we, we offer one scholarship for a woman. We want to support Latinos and we offer one scholarship for Latinos. That's the answer that we are giving now. I would like to share one experience with our young um, kids. They went to do um, to do audition for one orchestra. One was a um, white kid and the other was a Latina kid. Both they have the same level in the views of the teachers. And the kid got the, the place in the orchestra. And for the teacher, the girl didn't have the level for joining the orchestra. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. I, I would say that, uh, like, we have talked about this, uh, and it, this has been an uh, ongoing conversation about the audition process in orchestral, uh, how can be skewed. And I, I think that it, it is part of what, what Kalina says that we need to go look for those people that we want to have in our organization. And also, I think, I think, yeah, I, I don't think a curtains should be taken at the finals. I, so. you, you know, it's, it, I think, and I think the, uh, the audition uh, committee should take a bias training and commit to like a bias like agreement. Right. I think bias training is important. I mean, as much as you, uh, as much as you want to claim righteousness, sometimes it's so unconscious. I, I, I want to say as a woman Latina, I pro programming women, uh, I found my own biases, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm doing this like work of reckoning every day. I'm questioning myself. What happens when you have tenure and you have never been faced against the uh, or uh, faced with these conversations not against but with these conversations and you're securing your spot and someone comes and now it has to say about this you like the committees have to take training right 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 i want to i want to get to a question there's been some voting for some questions to be asked uh so i'm going to get try to get through these quickly as i can with the little time that we have left is, is there a tension between audience support of new or unfamiliar programming? How do conductors reconcile the space between what is popular and music by BIPOC composers that has been under or not played for centuries? So there's, and just to, give, and to put, bring a context that, you know, there, there's been music written for hundreds of years at this point by composers that are, are non-white and composers that are non-male. Um, is there a tension between the audience? Um, and what would you do? Uh, how do you bridge that gap to make sure that we're we're not having this this space between what's popular or what should be played? How do we how do we go about and, and reconcile that what has not been played for centuries? Yeah, yeah I wanna say uh, I, I wanna say that um, music as a communication process. Uh, have to just reach outside the podium like uh, like the conversation has to happen like you have to reach to the and and, uh, and tell yourself tell the audience why this is important and inspire them and and connect their ex their past experience to what it's about to happen when there is a disconnect between uh, between what they know like and what they can't hear they're gonna feel scared and they won't know, you know? Like, this is what, ha like, if you go, for example, to a museum and you see, I don't know, La Guernica or like a Miro um, piece, 
like you can come back and you will see it and it's going to be exactly the same. But like the experience of music happens so fast that sometimes if you, we don't have recordings, if we don't have recourses, we just have to use our word Absolutely. and tell them why this is important and, mm. and reach beyond, reach beyond the stage, be, reach beyond the podium. Talk and uh, tell your musicians to also fall in love with this because I mean, again, for me, it's like everybody has to be on board on why do we program this music. Mm -hmm. um, like we have to explain it so they can go and amplify the message for us as conductors and then the audience can amplify it to somebody else and say hey can you come and hear this piece you know I think it's it, the world has to be like beyond beyond the pro the I don't know this the sterile program notes beyond the prefabricated a uh, date, you know, New Year's or Valentine's of Dia de los Muertos, beyond that and go beyond and just inspired by the words. But why do we love this music so much? Why is it this? Like, why do we deserve to play it? Why do we deserve to conduct it? Right, right, right. I, I think I think a big part of it is um, rehearsal time, you know, give mm -hmm. the time, bring in the people that come from these specific places. I mean, do we have sometimes in spaces, do we have the personnel to properly interpret the music that we've been presented with? You know, with living composers, bring them there to give them the rehearsal time, give them the same amount of time you give the Brahms, same amount of time you give the Beethoven, not just the MLK concert, but one rehearsal, you know? Yeah, so certainly. Bring in that time and, and play it again and again and again. And this kind of leads to one other thing. Uh, we have one other question because we are about four minutes, four minutes left. How do you work with your orchestras when they struggle understanding slash so interpreting music by composers from traditions beyond their classical training? What advice do you have for your institutions to support their musicians to interpret with optimal integrity? Oh, that's a great open. question. Yeah. Glenn, do you want to answer that? Well, the thing that comes to mind initially for me is there has to be an educational component to it. And obviously not teaching your musicians how to, to play this music, right? But you just touched on it with what you said about having the composer in that room and starting a dialogue. So and starting a conversation so that when you can start to understand a little bit more about this piece, the history behind it, why it was written, what is it trying to say? I think sometimes when we get into the first rehearsal, we do think about rehearsal time. And there, there is no time set aside to talk about these different points and you know so I think that educational piece gets lost but I think that educational piece is also really important to understanding the piece as a whole All right absolutely um, I, I did a lot of music uh, from Latin America and I saw uh, audience uh, full of people stand up and clapping the problem is they don't know their repertoire mm. and with the musicians sometimes for example in the mexican music there is a lot of rhythms there are three against two and this is a little weird you know like eh. but when they do that new thing or and they fall in love with the music right and they understand um I, I remember one, um, one day we had this experience with um, Moncayo, um, Guapango. In the end in Mexico, um, the orchestras start to yell and Yoo! and and we asked the players to do the same in the beginning, like they didn't understand, but we explained that there is tradition. And in the end, everybody, some did it but they 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 feel it and they understood the tradition and if if the musicians are open you know and the audience are open the, the music has high quality absolutely and we have you to touch up. something i'm oh, sorry you said that you are you are you wrapping up yeah yeah we, because... we, we right we're right at our end of uh, uh, 10, 10 second answer okay because there's two things I think they uh, you guys answer I think just to just to get this into synergy, um, you said it Titus time, piece, new pieces and minority pieces need time and need the space to be heard well, you know like we cannot give them the five minutes of rehearsal, and also that comes from expertise, you yes. know that comes with the tradition that uh, Paula is. Talking. Like if you are going to champion a composer, you have 
to know it in order to inspire your musicians to play the best of their abilities. If you're yep. just like, yeah, one day you're going to explore one thing or the other and you don't have a clear idea. But I think that's the beauty and that is the nuts and bolts of being a conductor, just know your idea and bring it yep. to the people so they can play their best. And with that, I want to thank everyone for coming here today. Thank all of our panelists that were here today. Um, again, a call to action, you know, program the things. Invite uh, these three lovely conductors here to, to come and conduct your orchestra. And I just want to leave with one word as we pertain to repertoire. One thing that I, I championed is the Negro Folk Symphony at four standing ovation, not one, but two, but four at Carnegie Hall when it was premiered. Thank you so much for being here. Hope to see you all live next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Titus. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks.